This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. What's up, girl? Hey. Hey. How's it going? It's going pretty well, I would say. Where are we in our quarantine now? We are... Oh, God. What day is it? Um, it's and Wednesday. This year, the, year, the year of our Lord. We're recording this the day before we release it this time because time doesn't exist in the quarantine <laughs> and we forgot <laughs> when The it only was. way that Chelsea knows what day it is is if she has her Monday meeting. Right. My Monday meeting. And that's it. That's it. That's all we need. Um, I actually don't know how long we've been doing this. How many weeks? Let's think. Eight million. Eight million. <laughs> Roughly. No, I'm actually curious. This is week nine. Okay. So this would have been my seniors fun week. Today would have been the senior trip. Oh. To we're gonna go to a trampoline park. That would have been fun. I was kind of excited about it was that. One of the first things closed though, I remember. Was it? Trampoline yeah, parks trampoline should parks be closed were in pretty specifically. They're very out. dangerous. Um <laughs> We were going to do that instead of take them to the amusement park. But anyway, we were going to put them in danger instead of let them have fun. Well, I mean, the other option was ride roller coasters, which I would consider another sort of. Those are also dangerous. Yeah. So that would have been this week. Graduation is Saturday. So it's like weird end of year stuff. What are you doing for your graduation? We're at having your a drive through. Interesting. I bet there's some weird logistics involved in that that we don't need to go into, but yeah. I'm glad you're doing something. I'm glad you're able no, to do yeah, something for the kids. We're having like a videographer record it uh-huh. and put together a, uh-huh. a video for the kids. So I think that'll be cool for them to That's have good. to look back at. Yeah. yeah. It's not going to be what they Well, you wish just kind of make had, the most of it. Right, right. There's really nothing anybody can do. No. There's no perfect scenario. There's no... Hello? <laughs> I was trying to see what he's doing. Very interested in the neighbor's habits now. Um, this is what quarantine has done to me. I watched the squirrels. He is staring out the window <laughs> at the squirrels and our neighbor. Anyway, so it's Wednesday morning. What are we drinking? I'm drinking Diet Coke. I'm drinking coffee Coke and water. Zero. Coffee and water for me. I could use some water. We, uh, we're drinking this right now because we drank other things last night. We had a fire. A, a good, the good kind that's in a pit. Not, yeah. not. The bad kind that burns your house down. Anyways. Yeah, I had whiskey. You had beer. Coors Light. Coors Brought to you by Coors Light. Light. Straight swear, out of the Rockies. Really, we, we really need to get them to sponsor us. <laughs> so what have we what have we been doing to pass the time recently? We've been watching an unhealthy amount of TV. Yeah. First of all. Yes. I have the perfect segue. This is going to be very smooth. But okay. First of all, we've been watching TV. We watched some very good TV. Mm-hmm. We watched Outer Banks on Netflix. Very we like that. We just finished the first season of Ozark, which I like, mm-hmm. but it's very violent, yes. not kid friendly. And we've just been watching a lot of things in between. But we've also been, for the topic of this week's show, we've been playing video games. Lots of them. Uh, this week has been Animal Crossing. We finally gave in and got Animal Crossing. I'm not sure how I feel about it because it's just like real life where you go in debt to buy things and then work. But your this way debt up. in the work game is much off. more manageable than real life debt. It gets paid off much quicker. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. I guess so. This week, we're actually talking about esports in schools. Esports. And this is, this kind of came up because, well, our last episode was about the coronavirus, which like wasn't super fun, obviously, to talk about. But esports in schools is a, kind of exciting this week because the high school I teach at, we just, um, this past year, we had our first year of esports teams. Mm-hmm. Their season was cut short, unfortunately. Yeah. But we have them. Mm -hmm. And also because it's been something that we've been seeing a lot of people doing in the quarantine to help with isolation and boredom and frustration and all the feelings that we're all feeling as we get into this. It's a thing that you can do to be kind of semi-social in a digital way and, uh, you know, play Mm -hmm. with friends. And it's a nice way to just... I don't know. We we have a lot of streamers that we watch, and we'll get to what that is. But we we know about this world because we participate as consumers of it, right? So we're we're kind of a fan of the concept. So can, just for people who don't know what what is the esports, what esports, are esports are just online, usually competitive. And in the case of esports, when we're talking about it at like a high school level, it is a competitive gaming 
And it's either on a computer or a console. So video games. Mm Mm-hmm. But you're competing against other people. Other schools, yeah, with other leagues and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, And it's based on a variety of games, but our school this past year just got the funding. The funding is what most schools are, are needing because the computers to run these are not cheap. Yeah, you got to have a graphics card the size of a hoverboard, basically, to run these things at a competitive level. And you've got to have internet infrastructure in place to support it because yeah. you need bandwidth. Well, and you also like literally have to have a space to put it because it has to be in a secure place, you know, a secure place where it can be locked and taken care of where other kids can't, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So you need a so, physical plant. You need all this right. computer equipment. You need headsets and, and fancy keyboards. Mm-hmm. I just got a gaming keyboard myself. Yeah. Lights up. It's really exciting. So it's, it's expensive on the front end, but kind of what my research, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, but once you have that cost, the teams don't travel or anything like that. So the cost is just in that first thing, sort of. Mm-hmm. Because- like the stereotype, you might imagine. <laughs> it does involve a lot of sitting in a basement by yourself. And- <laughs> Our kids aren't in a basement at the school. Well, okay. So. <laughs> All right. Good for them. I'm glad they graduated from the basement. So is it a sport? That's the first question. Yeah. We were excited to cover this topic because we like gaming and esports and we're nerds and we grew up with playing video games that are kind of have grown to define the, the genre of competitive esports there is a lot of debate over whether or not this should be called a sport <laughs> i <laughs> i don't tricky. know i i think it is tricky i'm not sure if i'm completely satisfied with the answer of yes even though i i'm happy to call it a sport i'm not sure it completely satisfies my mind's definition of what sports are just because i imagine you know like running around outside basically or in a gym for a thing to be a sport but it's been considered enough of a sport for the international olympic committee to have a conversation about it in 2017 uh, again a lot of this has to do with they have to acknowledge how how popular it is it's a, it's a hugely popular form of entertainment right now it's becoming even more so competitive esports and gaming are just and streaming uh connected to it are just exploding in popularity Mm. right now so the olympic committee is like well i guess we're gonna have to acknowledge that (laughs) this thing is here to stay and that they they're they acknowledge that it can be considered a sporting activity they said the players involved prepare and train with an intensity which may be comparable to athletes in traditional sports so they're considering what games that might be suitable for olympic competition so it's at least on the radar of the International Olympic Committee. I don't know if that's the standard that you have to pass to be really considered. Like, I mean, who gets to define the IOC what it really is. isn't really a great, um, you know, place to have to go to. Yeah. I don't know. It, they, they're problematic. Well, they are. So, they are, but it's at least <laughs> it's a well-known international. Like, it's a regulatory body, and that's kind of the thing with esports that they're grappling for legitimacy in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways is that there aren't international or even sometimes national regulatory bodies to manage leagues and competitions and rules and things like that. So it's a little less structured than what we might consider a lot of professional sports to be, but it's gaining. It's taking on a lot of that structure well, as it as becomes long more as, popular. As long as softball isn't an Olympic sport, an event, I have no interest in talking about the IOC. <sighs> Don't get me started. I'm sorry. Anyways. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, um, anyway, I look, just, just for those who might be wondering how in the heck could this possibly be considered a sport, it requires a lot of hand-eye coordination and mm-hmm. uh, uh, kind of an alacrity of that stuff. And it also is a very... It's a very social thing most of the time. So a lot of these games, and we'll talk about some examples of games and stuff, but a lot of these games require teamwork, um, a lot of teamwork and coordination and communication. But it is a sort of also a a physical event. A lot of these professional gamers that we know of get their... their their wrists get worn out and stuff because they, you know, either Mm -hmm. mashing controllers or keyboards and mouse, um, just constantly such that they... Well, right those now. types of injuries are no different than someone who works at a computer all day who has, yeah. you know, they get carpal tunnel yeah, exactly. or you know, repetitive stress injuries and so things like that. It's so, all it's a similar sort of vein of yeah. But just to just to explain a little bit how it is kind of physical, it's it's right now we're seeing in the competitive esports space really young competitors winning things yes. big because the younger you are the quicker your reflexes with these kinds <laughs> of things and so it's really funny because the slightly older gamers they don't have that edge that the younger gamers do so we're seeing 
pretty pretty young, you know, like mm-hmm. 15, 16 year olds winning uh, worldwide competitions in gaming yeah. because they're just, I mean, it's also all they do all day, but we're going to talk about that too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. These, these, <laughs> I have a hard time calling some of these professional streamers, like the people who do this for their jobs as professional athletes. Although I know that like they're professional gamers, but they're also entertainers. And so this content creation is a huge side of all of their business you know what i mean like that's half the business for most of them like even when we're talking about like these really big competitive players half of their job isn't just playing the game it's also yeah i I would say that there are two sides to the coin of esports in the public's eye it really is what you're talking about content creation and then the competitive side a lot of people kind of focus on one or the other you're either all in on the competitive aspect or you're all in on the content creation side and you kind of dabble in the competitive side but usually it's kind of one or the other is your focus because it requires such a grind to really be competitive well, and they're similar to athletes you know normal physical athletes isn't like NFL and MLB and things like that because these people are getting paid to post ads they're getting paid to share you know stories and things like that testimonials about a product and it's that's exactly what's happening to the people that we watch who stream right they have managers like traditional you know yeah so they're treated just like and you know a, a normal sports athlete as far as coverage and things like that like they get invited to events a bunch of the streamers we watch were you know taken to the the super bowl so they're treated just like any other big entertainer yeah would be right it's just that their medium is a little bit different it's but, okay. different it's new it's evolving there's a lot that's really interesting that's happening in this space, yeah so but. let's talk about it at the high school level kind of what's happening there my co-worker um and then one of our tech guys is in charge of our our esports teams. We have four different groups right now. So there are a lot of esports titles that could be played, but right now at my high school, there are only four. But for anyone who knows anything about the game side of it, most of them are like Fortnite, League of Legends, Overwatch, PUBG, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, Rocket League, Call of Duty, Super Smash Brothers, Minecraft, uh, NBA 2K, Madden. Those are the games that most people have a league for or a team for. But my high school really have four right now four games i think it's Fortnite and overwatch we have like a jv and a varsity team we have one rocket league team and we might actually have two smash brothers teams but still so we've got almost 20 kids involved um which is basically the size of a roster of a varsity league anyways Mm -hmm. or for most teams Mm -hmm. um and so they practice after school and do all that kind of stuff but what we've seen happen like historically is that like what chelsea was saying that these young teens are competing at even huge i mean world levels of these gaming things and winning millions of dollars so there's been a push to incorporate it into high school as a way to kind of formalize it i guess i would say and it also helps bridge a gap because now college teams exist and so there are colleges that put students on scholarships to go to their school earn a degree and play video games and to compete for them So before I think, especially when like, I mean, we're 30. So when we were growing up, it was like the height of like, you can't sit at home and play video games all day. And like now there are people much younger than us, much more successful than us. You know what I mean? Making Mm -hmm. tons more money than we are Mm -hmm. by sitting home and playing video games every day. Yeah. And so now we're seeing like almost like a a real, a a transition that could happen for students who have an interest in this. I think we're changing the image of gaming. Right. Like they can go from a high school team to a college team where they might get a degree for free to then be, you know, used or whatever in a professional organization or team. Mm -hmm. And that that's a real path for people. Yeah. And it's much more likely, statistically speaking, to do that than it is still to become a professional athlete in like the majors mm-hmm. as far as like basketball or baseball. And I think part of the strength of looking at gaming as a profession is that because, again, because of this content creation side that we were talking about earlier, you don't necessarily have to even win to be wildly popular. Some of our favorite no. streamers are not at no. all in fact, they're usually not um, winners in these competitive spaces, <laughs> but they still have, you know, millions and millions of followers. Mm-hmm. These, some of these world league, like world competitive leagues will have their finals or whatever, mm-hmm. the final series in, in huge stadiums. Yeah. And it's just like thousands and thousands yeah. of people go and watch these things. Tennis in, stadiums yeah, they use for yeah. them. Yeah. So it's, uh, so it's kind of interesting because this 
this, like you were saying, this thing we used to, it was kind of pejorative, you know, oh, okay, you're just, you can't make a living sitting playing video games. Now you can make a living sitting <laughs> yeah. playing video games. And because esports is becoming more codified, like we were talking about, like these things are kind of becoming more serious about organi- organization and such. You can, there is a spelled out career path that somebody can take from high school all the way through, mm-hmm. you know, like you're talking about, you can get college scholarships. You can become pro. You might join an organization. Some of these, they're big uh, gaming. They're kind of like entertainment management organizations mm-hmm. slash. It's it's kind of weird. They like sometimes there's housing involved mm-hmm. with these orgs. They'll put they'll put all the all their gamers in a house together, and yeah. that's where you live and work. And it's Create. it's really intense. You know, we're talking about rogue phase hundred thieves. If you've heard of any of these, these are professional these are the organizations yeah these are professional organizations that manage the talent and the talent in this case are people who play video games mm-hmm. and stream it stream their playing live to thousands and thousands and sometimes millions of viewers can i say the one cool thing about seeing this happen in my high school has been the the group of kids who play we have like varsity athletes of other sports we have kids that i haven't really seen take an interest or be proactive in the high school setting in any sort of way that like a group represented them and so it's so cool to see these kids work together and get to know each other and get to play together because we're it it brings kids together that would have otherwise not had a common you and i mean like factor Mm -hmm. or something Mm -hmm. like that like the kids that i've seen talk in the hallways about whatever practice they had after school i was like these are, we are doing opposite things. You know what I mean? Like they were never kids I would have paired up as friends or anything like that, just based on the groups and things like that. So I love seeing the esports teams because it's forcing all kinds of kids to work together yeah. at something they all love and are very good at, and but I they think, have to yeah. find a way to do it. It's fun that it takes an otherwise solitary activity because you mostly can sit alone by yourself, yeah. uh, isolated. It takes an otherwise solitary activity and turns it into a social one when you think of esports yeah, it leagues does. it's really interesting i think especially for for high school i mean i read a statistic when we were researching this it's like something like i don't know like 85 percent of that's all that high one. school boys play games and like it's really high for girls it's like, like 78 eight, or yeah, something or, yeah it's high, high 70s or something like that like so kids a are majority playing. of kids are playing video games more or less seriously but it doesn't really matter the fact is it's out there and everybody's doing it and this yeah. is a way for those kids who have a real keen interest in it to find like-minded students yeah and I mean, I, on the education side of it, this stuff excites me because I am not an educator who believes that every single student needs to go to college. That is not something that I personally believe. Like, that's not part of, you know, what I preach or anything like that. But I think that these opportunities are going to really open up the doors for some students who might not have previously had an interest in college and can say, oh, hey, like, I can do this and learn, you know, computer design or graphics or, you know what I mean, like, find a bachelor's that kind of fits this interest while also kind of preparing them for that next level, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to open the door. I think it's going to help colleges have a different sort of recruiting option in one way. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to be more marketable for some students. I Which that, I think is cool. Right. I also think there's a close correlation between kids who later develop an interest in STEM stuff. There's a huge, yeah. That's one of the plugs and of playing this, video is that. games. I mean, that's honestly uh, has a lot to do with why I got into uh, computer science. Mm-hmm. And that's what I do now most of the time professionally. So, so that's why I, this is why I got into coding really, um, because I grew up playing fun computer games and I'm like, I want to know how to make this work, do how more. to do, how to create what I am consuming. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't do video game design, but I'm kind of adjacent to it and what I work with now. So it's like, it gave me an opportunity just playing, getting lost in these games that I grew up with. It gave me an opportunity to become interested in the profession that I am now. Mm-hmm. So that's, I mean, I think you're right that colleges are going to look at that as, as an opportunity to channel mm-hmm. kids into programs well and for students that i have a lot of kids who stream and so like if your kid or your students are talking about like mixer twitch or youtube YouTube, gaming or facebook game like that's what they're talking about they're talking about being on a platform sharing their gameplay with others who can watch and participate in it yeah just so just so our 
listeners, if you're not aware, can you talk? We'll just say what streaming as we t- keep talking about streaming, but it's a little yeah. Bit. So it's the sharing of your gameplay. It's a way to broadcast what you're doing, maybe even a video, you know, a live video stream of what you are doing and talking as you're playing, whatever. And so it allows um, viewers to then see exactly what's happening in your gameplay in real time normally. And there's usually a chat option, so that kind of gives them an opportunity to talk with the people who are viewing them. A lot of the streamers today that Chelsea and I watch um, and that we've come to just enjoy watching just for entertainment even did not go the the normal route that I think that maybe it's becoming, which is like... Some of them, it didn't exist yet. Right. But, yeah. I'm, but I'm even saying like of those guys, like I, I can only really think of one that I know for sure has a college degree, but that's because streaming is something you can start at 16 and just grow into. And so I think what these college opportunities, what these high school opportunities, they're going to they're going to kind of help solidify, you know, some potential for these students mm-hmm. as far as like, hey, if streaming doesn't take off, I mean, because it's a luck thing, right? To become a famous streamer is just an absolute act of luck. What else do I have? But yeah, the, the thing though I do want to mention about it is that you don't have to be a mega famous streamer to make a living doing no, it. No, you I, don't. I have a friend who maybe has, you know, hundreds of viewers on his stream whenever he streams, mm-hmm. um, maybe a thousand, something like that. And he, he's he's doing it full time. He's making a living yeah. with whatever, you know. Right. So it's not even something that you have to become hugely popular at to make a living doing. No. Now, it is difficult. It's a grind. Um, everyone's chasing after well, all those views, but it's possible that it can be a career even without wild I guess popularity. more where I was going with that was like, I've had a few parents come into parent teacher conferences and be like, they want to be a streamer. Mm-hmm. And like, how do I support that? And these are parents who probably would have considered a four-year college option. Mm-hmm. So I guess on my end, a lot of the kids that I've had the chat with the parents about, it's been, oh, they can go to school. And maybe get a partial scholarship or full scholarship. And so in the parent's head, it's it's a more, you and I mean, like, formal way mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of uh, achieving adulthood, I guess I would say. Because yeah. it, it follows the steps. It follows the formula that so many people believe is I how think, we should achieve it. And I think, I know I was talking about STEM and computer science and stuff like that. But I don't think it's even necessary to go that route in the college because like you could even do like communications and or business, theater yes. or business yeah. or um any of these things are adjacent to mm-hmm. the career of streaming because you have to be entertaining you know yeah. y- if you want to maybe that's the best way if you want to become a professional streamer is to become a better entertainer so yeah. go for you know theater or communications or something like that because you have to grab people's attention sure or like yeah like you were saying like business Mm -hmm. um again obviously some of the technology stuff but there are a lot of options that studying in college in a formal way could help you become a better even if that is your end goal right yeah right so you don't even have to like i was saying earlier you don't even have to win at the in the competitive space no you can be actually terrible in the competitive sta- space and still be a wildly popular Great streamer. Yeah. And I think that's kind of exciting. I think it's really, if we, if we compare that conversation to the one that surrounds professional athletes, it's always like, oh, so-and-so is great, but they never want a ring. And so that isn't necessarily the formula or how it can be perceived in the world of gaming because we know plenty of streamers who haven't really won anything of great, you know, whatever, money value or interest. And they're still incredible at their job and they're still great players. So it's kind of fun to see that conversation surrounding it sort of evolve over time. But I guess on the education side of it, I'm just excited to see an opportunity for kids with interests that are different. You know, like I think... High schools and other schools have kind of become so just formulaic in what they offer. Mm -hmm. You know, like there are only so many sports. There are only so, you know, but this opportunity will keep growing and evolving. Video games are not going anywhere. So there is going to, as long as there are video games, there's going to keep being a growth in this interest, I think. There are billions and billions of dollars in this industry. Yeah, and I mean, we're even talking about something that someday when Fortnite isn't played competitively, something will replace it. It's going to just keep evolving. So Mm -hmm. it's not going to go anywhere. Uh So there are, I mean, there are concerns with the concept. And we've talked about some of them. I mean, a big one is just overcoming this sort of default position that we know from time immemorial that says the video playing video games is a waste of time yeah. or that you're lazy if you play video games yeah. or uh, i mean another thing we're seeing is like screen time debates are mm-hmm. a big 
issue, especially for younger people. Yeah. Um, and this streaming video game phenomenon. There are definitely there's definitely a balance to be had. You can't kind of yeah. forego all other Oh, I mean I had I had a play you know, I had my Super Nintendo, I had my games and there would still be days my dad would or mom, whoever was home and around would just be like, It's nice outside, go outside. Right. And like I was like, Okay, you know. Mm-hmm. So I'm not <laughs> I'm not supporting the idea that you should just sit in a room and play video games. But I do think that there's some there there are some payoffs, right? Like there are some good things that come from it. But I think especially for teenagers, you just have to find a way to maintain the work. Like for them, like they have to know a schedule. If whoever's at home with them says if as long as you have these grades or if you have your homework done, you know, like then it can be kind of used then that way. But I know and we've seen this all the time whenever there's a new update to a game or a new game comes out, there are certain kids that aren't there because they're allowed to stay home and play whatever yeah, the game that's is. that's a little rough. That's a little rough. But that's no different than anything else kids skip for, so. I do think one other thing that's a little bit problematic in the space is that there's a huge gender imbalance in yeah. the, <laughs> the competitive space and even the streaming space. I know of one streamer, a, a woman, who isn't there to just present her body as an object of mm-hmm. attention on stream that's not to say there aren't many many more there are but right. i only know of one that i can watch who isn't i mean the, i don't know if you yeah. can use the word on, it's a tough one on they call themselves titty streamers yeah and because it's just that's what they're there they they acknowledge that they're there for men to look at their bodies and it's really for me, really depressing. And, it, and like almost all the streamers that we watch are are men and they don't even play with women most of the time because of even perceived issues of them having some sort of weird relationship with women. So that space needs a huge overhaul in in that department. And I have often even been like, you know what, I should just stream so that people can have an example of a woman streaming who is not there to present herself as something that men can ogle. It's just, it's it's really weird. And I wish it, we could make more progress on that front. Yeah. So, so like, you know, encourage your kids, if especially if they are young women, to participate in this stuff. There's nothing, I mean, if that's what they want to do, prop them up, you know, in any way that you can and just tell them that they don't need to be just an object of... Well, you really went that way, didn't you? I really... You really got on that soapbox today. It's not easy to navigate. And it's a harder area of entertainment for women to break into than it is for men. Absolutely. And so I think that's really the bottom line here. But I'm not trying to, you know, break. (laughs) I don't know if this is something we can solve, unfortunately. No, I don't think it can be solved overnight. I think the only way to do it is to make sure, like, especially as educators, if you especially if you have an esports league in your school, you got to be really cognizant of making sure the young women who want to participate in this can mm-hmm. and feel accepted doing so and mm-hmm. are not being targeted for harassment and all kinds of things. It it requires a special attention. It does. Yeah. But I guess in high schools, the first step is establishing it and having it. And from there, we can try to work out the, you know, the rest of it. But I think the most important thing is for, for high schools to see this as a, a great opportunity for kids. And I think that's, yeah. yeah, I mean, I know what you mean, but. I think we kind of need to change the dialogue about it still, because I think video games are still looked down upon, um, which is, I mean, and again, like, I understand some of the concerns, but as we've said, this is becoming a more and more social activity. Um, it is. It's becoming a way for kids to get together. Well, and that's some of the strengths of it. And that's right. exactly, I guess, kind of why we wanted to do this episode now is because you know, I've been reading online about how people who are suffering from anxiety and depression and things like that are off or because of the coronavirus are these things are heightened because of they're being isolated. And so video games are are a way to escape the reality, right? Like that's why there are nights when Chelsea and I will play games for an entire night and we'll get done playing and I had a great time and then I'll be like, oh, I could have done laundry. So like I still have this like tinge of guilt where I'm like, oh, I just use all this time to play this game. But it's so nice to have something that kind of just removes you from the imminent whatever of the current world and just allows you to be whatever. For me, it's something I enjoy. And so I know for people, especially those suffering right now i've i've read and heard from my friends and seen online posts and things like that that video games and like the connections that they have in these online communities have been a great way for them 
to stay connected and to stay involved and to keep their brains busy. While we can have the conversation of like, oh, go outside and do something. Or like, if you just play video games, you're lazy. Like it's actually doing a lot of good for people, especially during a time where we can't physically be together Mm -hmm. so often. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's kind of my soapbox. It's just like some people use it as a way to connect and to have social Mm -hmm. interactions and, Mm -hmm. you know, and so I think a lot of times it's like, oh, well, they're just down there alone, whatever. And it's like, well, they're probably not. Like, right. there aren't that many games that we even watch be streamed that are in, intended to only be one player. Right. Most of the games that these my students and stuff like that are interested in are games they have to collaborate or can right. if they choose to. Right. I mean, there's a lot to be said for the processing and things like that that happen in video games. Like, currently Chelsea is obsessed with the newest Zelda game. And it is filled with puzzles. And it takes some real thought to get some of these things, like in ways that like I haven't even had to think about achieving, you know, or completing some of the missions. So they aren't just push the button, watch the thing go, because that's the thing I think you hear a lot, too. Mm -hmm. The storylines are just as intricate and delicate as books a lot of times. Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of why I like I I grew up playing all these kind of open world rpgs role-playing games they're kind of like video game version of a D campaign or something like that they're they let you make choices for your character mm-hmm. sometimes those choices impact your entire gameplay all the way through and there, there's a lot of exploring solving and figuring and finding and that's not quite the kind of game that we're talking about with these competitive esports but it's i just think that i'm happy to change the perception around video games because a lot of these Uh, at least when we were growing up, a lot of the kids who were really into video games were kind of perceived to be social outcasts Mm -hmm. and pariahs. And I mean, I know that I was on the nerdy side (laughs) growing up. So playing video games was not necessarily something that you would show off like a badge of honor, but now it is becoming exactly that because of the popularity of these streamers. So yeah, I was, I mean, you were talking about this is a way to stay connected, especially during pandemic i there's an interesting article in the new york times a couple of days ago about one of our favorite streamers is dr lupo who's who was mentioned in it interviewed for it and it was talking about how this is a seems to be a pandemic proof career where most of the world economy is kind of grinding and struggling right now the streaming is completely safe and even experiencing an uptick because everybody's yeah inside and all you can do is consume entertainment mm-hmm. you know so they're I think that I can't remember what article it was. One of the articles I read said that I think in the month of April, people had played Fortnite for like 300 million hours, something like that. Sounds about right. So we're talking, I mean, we're talking about something though that like, (laughs) you know, is kind of untouchable in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be an interest. It's always going to be growing and changing and evolving. It's going to keep changing with us. Um, so when, you know, a lot of my kids are like, I want to do this and I'm like, well, figure out how to do it. Like if you can get in it and you can, you know, find out what that success looks like, like you're going to be able to keep a hold of it. Like it's out there. So I guess, first of all, we need to start by, you know, eliminating the stigma surrounding it. Video games is something that's someone who's lazy or whatever plays, Mm -hmm. but also know that if you are sitting at home playing video games, you have to support your life in other ways as well. (laughs) I I honestly, I really (laughs) And I'm a big reader, so I honestly believe that playing a good video game is no more no more of a time waster than reading a good book. I I agree. They're they're very different experiences, and they're not to be compared to one another. But it's it's sometimes maybe it's even a more social activity Mm -hmm. like we've been talking about. So it's I really think that that line of discussion is kind of ill-informed as to the nature of video. But even if you're just sitting at home reading, go take a nice walk. Like just get outside, you know. (laughs) Just do something like, right. I mean, it's not healthy for any of us to not, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Okay. So last week, our fill in the blank didn't go as planned. <laughs> oh, it didn't. Tell me about that. No, I want you to tell me about it. Okay. Because, well, well, I searched for the answer and was like, this is it. And right, then. Right. Right. Oh, so we had, we, we weren't quite precise enough in the asking of our question is what happened so we asked the question in 1892 this american institution became the first to offer correspondence courses what we should have said to be more specific was that this institution was the first u.s school to organize correspondence courses at the college level offering full credit for successful completion 
and using the same rigorous standards as in the classroom. That's what we were really thinking when we just weren't specific enough in asking the question. So we had in mind the University of Chicago, this extension division founded in 1892 and doing correspondence courses at the college level. But we had a listener write in and we didn't even say a location. So we had a listener write in and this was before 1892. This was in founded in 1873 mm-hmm. this is where things got tricky right <laughs> this is the the society to encourage studies at home is this institution it was founded in boston and it was the first correspondence school that was in 1873 yeah yeah so way before our whoops <laughs> yeah whoops so the founded in boston um by anna elliott tickner the society to encourage studies at home so if that was the answer that you were thinking of you were probably more right than we were <laughs> so <laughs> thanks to that listener good job for writing in we will be more careful about asking our questions in the future and do a little more research on them so anyway all right it seemed like an obvious answer and then as it always goes this is just like a class oh well yeah. you're also not wrong <laughs> you're, you're, you're more right than we are probably yes. so all right what's what's this week's fill okay. in the blank this week's fill in the blank is this how much money did 16 year old Fortnite player booga win in the inaugural Fortnite world cup in 2019 how much money how much money did booga win 16 year old competitive player yep it's a lot of money for a 16 year old for a lot of money okay what did we learn this week who wants to go first you want to go first (laughs) we were driving (laughs) i don't remember where we were driving but I was having a moment where I was staring off deeply at something, and you'd apparently been trying to talk to me, I think, because right, you'd like broken my, my, my vision or whatever was happening in my head as I was consuming this information. And Chelsea was like, what? What is happening? We're like, you weren't listening. And I had just read on a billboard that gorillas sing a happy song or hum during meals. And I was like thinking about that because my friend, I won't name him here, but one of my best friends, he does like a little happy dance when we when the food comes. And I know other people who do like a little, you know, jig wiggle thing. When the food comes, it's like our, you know, lizard brain taking over to be like, yes, chicken tenders are here. So gorillas do it. Gorillas. Yeah. And this Sing is from... and hum. <laughs> yeah. They, while eating. Yeah, because they're pleased. And I just identified... No, but um, Chelsea found me a link to the New Scientist website. This is from 2016, so I doubt they've stopped since then. But they they do express contentment with their meals. Wow. <laughs> and they also tell each other it's dinner time, which I just think is so sweet. And there are a couple of examples of um, singing and humming of gorillas, but I will not play that here. Um, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, but it, this the person who wrote about this said that they don't sing the same one over and over. Um, it seems like they're composing little food songs. So that's I, pretty cute. I was just so. It was one of those things that, as I was reading, it just really, it just really took over in my head. And so I missed whatever Chelsea was asking me about or whatever we were discussing because I just couldn't stop thinking about it. I can understand that. It's a pretty disarming fact. It's so cute, though. It is cute. I like it. The idea of I a like huge that. gorilla humming like while just eating. Really pleased with his whatever they eat. I don't know leaves. <laughs> I really don't know. What I actually don't eat, really know honestly. what gorillas eat. I didn't do enough googling. So that's what I learned this week: is that gorillas hum or sing when they're happy and they're eating. Interesting. Yes. Okay. What you learned is much more practical, and I know I that. Just, but I, mean, I no, just no, no, no. Sometimes it's just those little nuggets that right. you weren't looking for that are just so satisfying. There's no practicality requirement on the what I learned. <laughs> I mean, mine was very practical. I learned this week how to build a raised garden bed, and I did it. You sure did. Uh, it's probably a little bit overdone at this point, but the theme of being isolated is that people are doing things like baking bread and gardening and stuff they and never doing had time all of them. for. I did all of them. Yeah, we're baking <laughs> bread, we're gardening. So yeah, I bought a bunch of lumber. Didn't cut your fingers off? No, I used a circular saw. I used a drill and I made a raised garden bed. We did a lot of backbreaking shoveling to level out of space in the backyard for this. Some help from my dad. Right. Saved us. Yes. But we level out of space back there and we filled it with some of our dirt that we had moved and we're gonna get some garden soil but it keeps freezing it does because it's ohio so it's not yet time to really plant things because they'll probably die but pretty soon we're gonna be planting some stuff in these raised garden beds that i learned how to make i mean it's really it's just two layers of 
squares basically <laughs> on top of one another but i wasn't gonna thing, tell them <laughs> yeah it's not a very complicated uh woodworking project so anyone can do it honestly but i can't well it was a lot of fun i like projects and building things and tinkering so it was a perfect way for me to keep my mind off of the coronavirus for a little while so it was a fun project it was good i recommend it, it looks great got the space in the backyard yeah it looks pretty good it's very it's very rewarding it almost looks like i knew what i was doing almost it really looks like if you it. don't get too close to it bob vila that's what i was thinking uh-huh, of. it's very uh-huh. he would be proud i'm yep. sure so do we have any final thoughts to wrap up for the episode the one thing we didn't mention was that these streamers and like other athletes they're not just sitting there not doing things to help others and i think that's another view of video games and people who stream and things like that that they're just sitting in their room taking the money not whatever you know and so i think it's important to mention that almost all of the streamers that i can think of that we watch have done something for charity and that they'll dedicate like specific streams of whatever game to raising money for things that mean a lot to them so there are lots of big charity events yeah so um one of them jack courage dunlop just did a big one for the coronavirus raised a ton of money because his grandmother passed away from it so he did a big stream for that and then one of the i would say probably one of the biggest was dr lupo's stream and he always fundraises for saint jude's children Mm -hmm. hospitals Mm -hmm. and he did a 24-hour stream and it raised more than two million dollars yeah so we do see these people going out of their way to sort of spread positivity and things like that so i think that's cool as someone who consumes that form of entertainment because it makes me feel good to know that these are people my students watch and they see them kind of right you know i mean yeah so yeah uh we we've known of a bunch you know ninja gives a, a lot of way to charity has yes. matching dries all the time mm. uh, that's tyler blevins so i just these are just ones we watched tim well, tim the time man has and twitch has to, guardian con is uh-huh, what it was used uh-huh. to be called and and so that was a big thing that they would piece together a different hour like streamers would get like a two-hour block and that would be their guardian con time mm-hmm. and that was the only time they would stream that day mm-hmm. so it would drive viewers to the one channel who was streaming for guardian con and then that would help you and I mean yeah. raise more money for yeah. whatever Guardian Con was supporting that year. I know that even our friends have taken the cue from some of these famous streamers and done charity events of their own. Um, we have a group of friends that every year they do this thing called Extra Life where they get together. And I think they stay up for 24 hours straight and they have yeah. people, friends and family sponsor them and they'll just stream, uh, you know, play games together for a charity raising money for, I can't remember what they picked this year, but just all kinds of different things. It's really fun to see that community give back and to sort of foster a culture of Mm -hmm. giving back so i mean we keep mentioning dr lupo ben lupo is one of our favorite streamers and it's just it's really cool to watch that stuff it's just they're playing games and streaming like they usually do but it's you watch this huge stream of just dollar donations coming in for charities well and like for lupo's big one like he partnered up with all of his sponsors and things like that so that when you donated you were entered in a raffle to win all types of things so that that's obviously an easy way to get um interest into donating uh but it's also just done because they they know it's right and so like ninja uh tyler blevins one of the other streamers one of his big donations was just to a food bank and he's outside of chicago and so he's been trying to help with things that are affected by current or people affected by coronavirus to mm-hmm. help support food banks, get food to people who need it. So they'll all take on all kinds of, I guess, reasons to help people and to and to give their time and effort. And so I think it's just also kind of changes the narrative of the stereotypes of streamers mm-hmm. to know that mm-hmm. they're not these people who Gamers. just sit there. And, yeah. yeah, like they're they're people who have world interests and care and are compassionate and are willing and things like that so it and i like that as a teacher because i i want my kids watching people who do those types of things absolutely i mean it's really cool i get i i weep a little bit oh, i, I always... get emotional watching big fundraising drives for things happening on the streams so. yeah so the saint jude's one is just how do you not yeah. want to throw all your money at saint jude's so yeah yep all right well that probably about wraps it up for the week any final thoughts no, just take care of yourselves. Find something to do. Maybe play a game. Yeah, maybe try out one of these games that you've always wondered about. Or watch a really fun stream on Twitch or uh, Mixer or somewhere like that. Maybe find an interest that you didn't know you had because that's how we got into it. I kept yep. forcing Chelsea to watch some of the streamers I'd been watching. Yeah. And she got me into some of the games that she'd been playing that I hadn't ever had a real interest in. And that's how we kind of swapped our 
our gaming interests. Yep. So I would just encourage it. It's it's a neat community. And probably going to make some new friends. You're probably yeah. going to find some new And find ways if you're a teacher, you know, to support kids with these interests. Or um, if you're a parent, you know, find an, easy, an easier way, I guess, to navigate this as something good and productive in their life. And not just something that keeps them glued to the TV. Yep. See you next time. See you next time. Bye. Listeners, thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're trying to grow our audience, so please check us out at 16to1.com, all spelled out, and tell your friends about the show. On our website, you can find links to follow us on social media, an archive of all our old episodes, and a contact form where you can get in touch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. Can I please have a bubble machine?